Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you this morning absolutely desperate for you. We are desperate, Lord, that your spirit would move in power in our midst. We are desperate, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to the scriptures. And we pray this morning that you would allow me to get out of the way, that you might speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This week I, I watched a video that was of a it was recorded in a shopping mall in Texas. And it was of a, a mall security guard demanding that a man leave the mall compound for sharing his faith with two people that he had, he had approached in a friendly conversational manner. But the guard overheard that he was sharing the gospel and demanded that he leave because they were, he was soliciting. Now, the man being accused of soliciting was filming this on his phone, which is the thing that people do nowadays. You've got to be really careful what you say anymore. And he was challenging the guard by insisting that he had the First Amendment right to speak whatever he wanted to whomever he wanted without interference from a mall security guard. And clearly the couple that he was talking to was not upset about what they were talking about. They weren't offended in any way. But the cop again demanded that he leave the premises as it was private property and that they had a no solicitation policy. He actually handed the man a copy of this policy. Now, possibly the security guard was in his, within his legal rights. I'm sure that he was because later on the police came and wrote the man a ticket for soliciting on private property. But it was what the security guard said next that really surprised me that I paid attention to. He said, I don't care what you think your rights are. And I, I'm again telling you to leave. I also want to assure you that I'm a better Christian than you are, as he pulls a cross out from behind his shirt. But I'm not a fanatic about it like you are. At least I know that I should leave God in the church instead of being out in the mall preaching the gospel. Well, of course, the man continued to challenge the guard because the man was uh, not going to leave. And, and the, as I said, the police came and they escorted him off the property. Now, what I recognized about this is that there was a chasm between, between two people who considered themselves Christians. And I was, one felt so strongly compelled by the gospel that he wanted to share it with other people and the other one didn't feel that way about that. Now, I know what the term fanatical means, but I decided to look it up because you can Google anything you want to nowadays. And, and I Googled it, what does fanatic mean? And, and Google says it's a person filled with excessive and single-minded zeal, especially for an extreme religious or political cause. Now this video resonated with me because I had been accused on more than one occasion of being a fanatic or of being more importantly, I, I, being a radical Christian is what I've been called. And so the question I asked myself this week as I was thinking about this is how could someone have a real encounter with Jesus Christ and not be radically changed? Or after experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, how could you not seem fanatical to those who have not experienced that? Because really the issue is between light and darkness. And so our passages this, this morning have a lot to teach us about these questions. Let's begin by considering the story of Jesus ascending back to the Father and the instructions he left with the disciples. Let's read again Luke 24, 44 to 49. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. 
And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now consider the context of what is happening here in Luke 24. Two men who, have, who had been on the road to Emmaus, they had left Jerusalem disappointed when they saw Jesus crucified and buried. And they're heading back to Emmaus talking about, it. you know the story, and, and Jesus pulls up alongside of them and talks to them, and they eventually realize it's Jesus that's talking to them. And so rather than staying in Emmaus, they turn around and hightail it back to Jerusalem. They want to find the disciples. And they finally find them, and they, they're, they're in the process of telling them the, the encounter they had had with Jesus, that he was still alive. When suddenly Jesus once again walks through a locked door and says, peace be with you. Now you'll notice in the scriptures whenever Jesus or an angel says, peace be with you, there is a reason that maybe peace would not be yours at that moment. But in the scriptures... There's always a reason to find peace. And the Prince of Peace has just shown up. In Luke 24, 37 to 43, it says, But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it's myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it. Now he, he took and ate a piece of fish to prove the miracle of the resurrection. This was his body. The same one that hung upon the cross. A ghost would not be able to consume a piece of fish. And so Jesus was showing that he was material, he was not spirit. But what Jesus said next is vital for them to remember and understand. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus points them back to the scriptures that foretold of the coming of the Messiah and what his mission was. What Jesus had done was no accident. And the threefold division of the Hebrew Bible, the, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, all had pointed to one thing. They had pointed to what God was going to do in the Messiah. And now here he was, having fulfilled all of that. And the beauty of it was, it says that he now opened their minds to understand the scriptures, the things that had formerly eluded them. I mean, how many times have you read the Gospels and Jesus said something and then the apostles go, I don't get it. You're kind of going, what? what's there not to get? But now Jesus has opened up their minds so they can understand these things. And now they have been given the ability to see them clearly and to understand. The scriptures had foretold that the Messiah would come and he would suffer and be crucified, but he will be raised up on the third day. And he's standing right in front of them. And so he says, you're the witnesses that this is true. You have seen this. You were there the whole time. You saw me uh, crucified. You saw me laid in the tomb. And now you're seeing me here eating fish. And so they were to be his witnesses. As witnesses, they were to now go and proclaim the good news of the gospel, that forgiveness of sins had come, and there was now a way back to the Father, but it was only going to come through the Son. But they would need power from on high in order to accomplish this. And so they're supposed to stay in the city to wait until they are clothed with power from on high. Now, while Jesus was standing before them as, as physical proof of the resurrection, while he's there, they're going to feel emboldened. It's like when you're a kid and you're holding your father's hand. Some big guy can come up and say what he wants, but you don't care because dad's here. Dad's scared, but you're not. <laughs> so they felt emboldened because Jesus was standing there with them. But they were going to need the power of the Holy Spirit once he ascended it back to the father. 
They were going to need the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to remain strong. And to be the constant reminder of all the things that Jesus had taught them. And how the scriptures had foretold all these things. It would be the Holy Spirit who would open up the minds of those that they were going to be witnessing to. But the Spirit's presence will be flowing through them, just like it does through us if we are believers. And Luke provides an account of the ascension of Christ back to the Father in the Gospel, as well as in the book of Acts, because Luke wrote both. But I want to focus on the account from Acts. So let's read Acts 1, 8 through 11. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same ways you saw him go into heaven. Now they have just, they have, this is, they have seen Jesus in the, the, alive, resurrected, and now they're seeing him ascend back to the Father, and then they turn and see two angels. This is a big day for them. It's a lot going on. But you have to wonder what they were thinking as they watched Jesus ascend back to the Father. Because Jesus had... Like I said, he had opened up their minds to understand the things of the scriptures. And so perhaps one of the things they're thinking about as they're, as they're watching him go up is the prophecy of the vision of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel 7, 7 13 to 14 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So now that Jesus has opened up their minds, now this becomes clear. As a matter of fact, maybe they're, they're remembering now that Jesus had referred to himself as the Son of Man. In the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 69 times Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. In the gospel of John, it's 12 times. And each time, it's referring to the Messiah. And Jesus makes this claim before the Sanhedrin. And it's this claim as to who he is as the Son of Man that got him killed. If you remember in in Matthew 26, 64, and 65... So the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. So now as the disciples are watching him ascend into heaven, possibly they're reflecting upon this vision of of Daniel and remembering that Jesus is the Son of Man who was to be given back to the Ancient of Days as the reigning King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he was their King. And he was their Lord. And he was the King of a kingdom that would never be destroyed. And in Acts 1-3, we we read, He presented Himself alive to them after His suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. From the time of Jesus' ministry, He began talking about the kingdom of God. And they were to understand their ministry was to proclaim the good news that promises that everything that God had promised had been fulfilled. And and therefore, they must go and tell all people in all places. The message from the beginning of, in the Gospels from John the Baptist through Jesus was about the kingdom of God had come. And Jesus, 
his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, was the sure indicator that the final reign of God had arrived. And to bear witness to this was to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. And as they walked back to Jerusalem to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them, Luke records that they worshiped Jesus and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. They now knew for sure of the divinity of Christ. And there was to be no more hiding in fear of the Jews. But instead they boldly entered the temple and they were there continually blessing and praising God. They may have been perceived as fanatics. (laughs) When you finally realize who Jesus Christ is and the relationship that he has called you into, It's like a light switch being turned on and the darkness going away. The result can never, ever be neutral. But it should bring about a powerful change in thought and in action. For me, the name of Jesus caused caused my heart to leap from the time I first met him. And it still does. I remember when I first heard the song, there's something about that name. I felt a surge of joy. It brought tears to my eyes. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Amen? Amen. No wonder the disciples actually did what Jesus was asking them to do. They went back to Jerusalem to wait for the power that would be poured out upon them by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was gone. They could have very easily have turned around and gone back to their former lives. And most likely no one would have blamed them. But why do you think they did that? Because they had seen and they had been with the resurrected Lord. And he had opened up their minds to all that the scriptures had talked about. How could they return to the way that things had been before after they had met Jesus? All they could do, and I suspect all they wanted to do, was to wait and see what it was going to be like when the Holy Spirit came upon them in power. Would it make them more like Jesus? Well, that's something we're going to talk about next Sunday on Pentecost. Also, I think they waited because it was Jesus that told them to. And they loved him so much. And they wanted to see him again. And now they knew that they were going to. In our epistle reading from from Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes that he's praying for the Ephesians. He writes that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might? In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he actually has two prayers that he writes for them. One is this one in chapter 1, and the other is in chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. But in both prayers, he wants the Ephesians to remember all that God has given them in Christ. He prays that they'll have the wisdom and the revelation as to who Jesus is, and he will stay with them. He wants them to see clearly that the power that has been poured out into them in the Holy Spirit is the same power that the Father used to resurrect the Son. This miracle working power, this power that does the impossible, this power that changes everything. And the Lord they now served 
now ruled and reigned in righteousness at the right hand of the Father. And Paul is quoting from the book of Daniel. He reminds them in all glory and honor and dominion and a name that was given above all names were put under his feet. And that includes all nations, all people, all rulers, and all authorities. And Paul wanted the church in Ephesus to to walk in that power, to live in that power. And that's what God wants for us this morning too. He writes, have the eyes of our hearts enlightened that we may know what is the hope to which he has called us and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. If we really understand all that God has given us in Christ and what he has called us to do, and if we have hungered for the Holy Spirit to give us more and more and more of Jesus, well, I think we we will be seen by the world as fanatics. The world doesn't normally object if we believe in God or if even we believe in the truth of his word. As long as we take the advice of the security guard and leave God in the church. If that had been God's will for us as Christians, then the disciples would have had no reason to go and wait for power to come on high to indwell them because they were not to stay in the church. The Spirit came to indwell them, that they might have the power to take the gospel to the entire world. And that mission is ongoing. It has not been rescinded. We must be diligent in giving our lives to the proclamation of the gospel. And this morning, there are four questions I want each of us to ask ourselves. Number one, have I indeed invited Jesus to be the Lord in every area of my life? Or am I holding back something? Number two, have I invited the Holy Spirit to fall upon me in power or have I thought that was too fanatical? I don't need it. Number three, does my life reflect a commitment to the building of God's kingdom or my own? And number four, and this is important, Lord Jesus, what would you have me do? Remember the exhortation from the psalmist in Psalm 47. There's no reason to pay attention to this psalm if this is not your heart. It makes no sense. You're wondering to yourself, perhaps, how can I do this? How can I clap my hands, all peoples? How can I shout to God with with loud songs of joy? For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nation. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. I believe that God is moving in our midst. And that God is preparing to do a work in us that we have not yet seen. And so I'm asking each of you this week to be praying what role God has for you in this ministry and in his kingdom as we wait for more power from on high to rain down upon us until Pentecost in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.